Right, Joby, it's a pleasure to see you. This month, the EFL has launched their Together Against Racism campaign, calling on all football supporters up and down the country to report any instance of racism and discrimination, both in stadiums and online. Knowing you as a colleague, knowing you now as a friend, you've got to agree with that. You're calling me a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it'd be the perfect opportunity to come and discuss. I mean, it, it's such a big banner, isn't it, to try and fit everything underneath and to have an opinion underneath it. But let's start with that first port of call. We're looking to make sure that these stadiums, uh, the match day experience online and actually in the, in, in, the, in the building is something that everyone enjoys and is very, very inclusive. You yourself playing football, in and around football. Is it something that you've had to battle for all 41 years on this planet? Sadly, yeah. Um, and a lot of my experiences with racism actually have come in and around football. Uh, I was very fortunate. I grew up in Tottenham, an incredibly diverse, multicultural community. And in terms of growing up, going to school, knocking about on the weekends, not really too much. And Certainly nothing I can really remember standing out in terms of racism because it was just such a melting pot of different cultures and people from all different backgrounds. And it was a great place to grow up. My first probably real experience of it came once I joined a, a Sunday league team. We were only sort of 11. Mm -hmm. And we had a team I used to play over at Broadwater Farm Estate. We then joined a, this team. So sort of like five, six black boys playing in a predominantly white league. Again, we were just there to play football and just go and enjoy ourselves. And we were beating a team. And all of a sudden, from the sideline, one of the dads of one of the other boys calls out, you know, oh, you need to stop him. He's a this. So we've kind of all looked around a little bit, a bit miffed. <clears throat> As I say, for me, it was my real first experience mm. of, of hearing, um, you know, somebody call someone a black something. Um, our coach at the time, Clasford Sterling, who did some outstanding, still does outstanding work in the community in Tottenham, um, came over and it was a really big moment for all of us as young kids in terms of how he was going to deal with that mm. situation. I know what he wanted to do. Um, and I've been in that situation as an adult where your first reaction is, you know, it's going to get physical very yeah. quickly. Um, I think he understood that he had a duty to us as, mm -hmm. as young black boys mm -hmm. in terms of how to deal with situations like this. So he went over, um, addressed the dad, spoke to the opposing coach, the referee got involved. Um, they wanted to carry on the match. Uh, no apology was forthcoming. So he just got us all together, took us off the pitch and, um, you know, we left the venue and I could see in his eyes, you know, he was absolutely stewing mm -hmm. as we all were. Yeah. Um, but he told us there's no way that anybody can speak to any of us like that and that would ever be acceptable. So we'd have to remove ourselves from the situation. So again, that was my first real experience of it. And as I say, it taught us a really powerful lesson even back then, um, not to tolerate mm. it, not to accept it. You know, it would have been very easy for us to have just carried on the game mm. and, you know, but that wasn't the most important thing that day. The key thing that jumps out of that is, be, and it, it's that it's a bit of a cliche, but it's that language of football because it crosses boundaries, continents, cultures. Because, as you say, as young kids, you're picking the best players for your team. You're picking your mates that you want to play football with. And because an adult's steamed in and given their opinion away from that, that sense of, of, of shock that comes with that is far and away why we all get into football and what football is about. And it's ironic that you say that the, the places that you found yourself in have come as a result of yeah. football. But football being that bit in the middle, which seems to speak to everyone, is it hard to marry those two things up then? Yeah, listen, I get around football, the passion side of it. People are obviously incredibly emotionally engaged and, and charged up at times. Um, one thing I've always found, and this is not just related to football, I've had arguments with people out on the street. I've had road rage incidents mm. where, you know, someone's calling you, every other name under the sun. And again, you know, if the N word comes out or you black this comes out, I never can understand. You've, you know, you've had that? Oh, multiple, multiple times. Yeah. As in, you can hear someone saying it oh, listen, into your car or read yeah, yeah. the lips or? I was, um, again, around the football club. This wasn't directly to do with football, but I finished a game at Reading 
um, now well into my adult life. I was mm. in the car after a game. Uh, traffic around the Majeski is always crazy straight away. So there was two lanes going into one. I was actually in the car with my cousin, who's white. Uh, my mum's obviously English. I was on the phone to my wife, um, again, who's white, um, half white, half Chinese. And woman's cut me up. I've sort of given her a little bit of like, you can't be doing that. Mm. She sort of looked in the car, her windows down. Like, who are you talking to? That sort of, and I'm like, I'll oh, just, you know, get on with it, yeah, drive yeah. past. So she stopped the car, looked across. Shut up, you N-word, yeah. Bold as brass with the window down. Yeah, 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 yeah. She had a passenger in the car. So again, straight away, this has gone from just a general <laughs> disagreement and an incident that happens all the time mm. to why would that be your next port of call? And my cousin who's in the car, he can't believe it. Obviously my wife's like, what did she just say? Mm. Like, so again, I'm like, what's my move here? Like I wanted to pull in front of her, stop the car. I've got a good friend of mine actually, who's a police officer. So the first thing I did was phone him. Listen, I've just been racially abused. He's like, get the number plate. You know, my cousin was in the car. It's gonna be really hard to probably go and prove it, which mm -hmm. again is another issue that you know, we'll probably get onto later on. But yeah, it really stopped me in my tracks, man. And it was sort of something that took him by surprise, I think my cousin, but just, yeah, she had no like other way of dealing with the situation, having to, to deal, to deal with it that way. Mm -hmm. So, and again, my wife was livid, obviously. Um, and again, it just showed me, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, where you are, this is something that affects people every single day, up and down the country in all different walks of life. And it's still, you know, as prevalent as it, as it ever has been. That's, that's a bit that, and when I say intrigue is not the word, interest is the word, because intrigue makes it sound, a, is, is a very twee way of, of, of talking about trying to find out something that's completely different from your lived experience. Born and bred in, in Yorkshire, up in Hull, leaning towards multiculturalism and, and especially with it being a port city um, a, a very, very long time ago, a bit like if you kind of dial it down to the south of the country, Portsmouth, where, where your yeah, mother's yeah. from and, yeah. and your dad coming yeah, over yeah. from Jamaica as an immigrant um, to try and reconcile the two. So that being something that would happen to you. Yeah. People can cut me up and wind the window down, call me every name under the sun, but it would never be based on... No on the color of my skin at all would it and um so to just to just to provide that context so i mentioned your dad who i know you're very very close to and very very proud of he's very very proud of you um him coming over to england from a different country a different continent and finding a place within the society marrying a, a white woman um take me take me back to that and from what he's told you what he found when he first came over, what his country yeah. or the country that he came to was like in an acceptance type of way? Well, there was no acceptance mm. for, for a start. Um, and what they were certainly told, he was part of that Windrush generation. He arrived in 1958, you know, under the premise that there would be work, mm. you know, they would be supported, they were welcome here. Everything turned out to be completely the opposite. You know, as you say, you're in a completely foreign country, climate, food, mm -hmm. everything is just completely- it's Literally a world away, isn't it? Yeah. Way. And then on top of that, the people that were here were completely, completely not willing to accept mm. this generation of people that, that came over to help, to try and improve the country, to work. Mm -hmm. You know, he worked on the railways for many, many years to start with trying to obviously be part of that generation that every kick-started everything and, and got everything going. Well, it's ostensibly off a little bit further off the back of the Second World War. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To get a country, it was very much a, a rebuilding process. On yeah, absolutely. You know, you had you obviously go. nurses, people mm. that worked in the NHS that did incredible work. So, um, yeah, very hostile. Um, I'd say every day was a challenge. Mm. Um, and it's actually, as much as really important for me to talk about my experiences, sometimes I sit here and go, oh, well, a woman called me a N word or. You know, I didn't get into a bar once because I was mm. with a group of four black friends mm. and that's a difficulty at times. And it's nothing compared to what my dad had to go through, you know, in terms of issues with the police, couldn't find anywhere to at times try and buy a property, worked so hard, he saved his money, 
wasn't welcome in certain neighborhoods. He'd go to an estate agent. All of a sudden, the price that was quoted normally would mm. be above what he could obviously afford at that time. And it was just a day-to-day, -day, he would say, probably planned uh, dismantling of a generation of people mm. to try and break them down because they weren't welcome. And many of his friends did struggle, um, you know, and again, by this point, a lot of people who were working here, they were sending money back home to support people at home and mm -hmm. support their families. He was only 22 when he came over, left his whole family. Never saw his dad again. Um, Never? No, no, no. Because it was just impossible to go back, you know, in terms of financially. Uh -huh. The restraints that obviously he was under here, just trying to survive. Mm. You know, they had communities that they would all basically each month contribute. And then at the end of that month, one person would get that allocated a bit of money. And then the next month they'd pass it on to somebody else. So that sense of community and helping each other was absolutely huge. And that is how they survived. They didn't get any help from anywhere else. Mm. It was very much off their own back. So everything that he went on to achieve you know, whether it was buying his own property, running his own business, bringing us up, um, you know, in often difficult circumstances mm -hmm. is something that again, and he would tell us, you know, again, when I was a lot younger in the youth team, we'd get pulled over all the time by the police. There'd be sort of four or five black guys. And this wasn't, you know, we're in, and not that this is ever going to be acceptable, mm -hmm. but maybe in a car that a 17 or 18 year old traditionally wouldn't be driving. Okay. Okay. We're in a Ford Fiesta, mm. my first car, or a Fiat Punto, like yeah, back yeah. in the day. Show my age a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, we'd go across to training at Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a world away again from where we were all brought up. You know, nice part of Surrey. We trained in Roehampton. But to get through, we'd have to go through Wandsworth, through Battersea. The amount of times during my scholarship that we got pulled over for absolutely nothing. It would be, oh, we've had a report of reckless driving with a car that matches your description. I'm thinking, well, we haven't been driving recklessly. Mm. But again, these were lessons that my dad, through his experiences, and listen, he's been physically assaulted by mm. police getting pulled over for nothing. Oh, your, your light's not working today, mate. Or, you know, your tire looks a bit flat there. And, you know, almost to the point of prov provocation yeah. to get a response. And he learned very quickly that if he did respond, it's only going to end one way. Mm. So I was very fortunate that he would obviously give us that guidance and also that I was with a group mm -hmm. that kind of kept each other going at times because it's demoralizing. Yeah. You're driving, you're not doing anything wrong. We got pulled over once and the simple question is, why are you here? Why are you in this part of London? And we're like, for one, we could be anywhere we want, yeah. but we've got a genuine reason we're coming from work. Oh, where do you work? We play football. We're scholars at uh, Wimbledon. Mm, not sure about that. Not sure about that. To the point where, have you got a contact for somebody at Wimbledon? Yeah, yeah. yeah. To verify yeah, who yeah. you were, why you were yeah. there, and, and, and what you were yeah. doing going through that particular part of London. And you feel you have to then justify yourself for doing nothing wrong. I'm coming back from work. It's 2.30 in the afternoon. Mm. And the kind of feelings that then makes you have to deal with because you do feel like you're being questioned mm -hmm. you know you're being looked at a certain way you're being profiled like i can go out into london i can go out into the city exactly the same issue we had another time where say exactly the same scenario we're getting in the queue five of us queues going down queues going down and this is the other thing about sensing and being aware mm -hmm. of us being judged differently to other mm -hmm. people straight away you start seeing the sort of walkie talkie the bouncer on the door obviously someone who is working on the door they then start talking so straight away we'll look at each other and just be like here we go akin to being sat in that car 20 years ago exactly you're thinking this is a, this we this know is, what's gonna happen we know what's lads. gonna happen yeah. right and again this is a group of adults we'd gone out for a, a meal then we wanted to go to a little bar this was in shoreditch somewhere Successful, well-to-do adults that are professionals. That All are professionals, which again, men. by the way, should not matter. No, oh, not in the slightest, no. Do you know what I mean? Mm. This is just... But if you're going to start profiling somebody, right? go down the list. But if that first profile is literally... Black, mm. that's it. Yeah. With no other consideration. Do they look smart? Have they been drinking? Yeah. Are they out of control? Real reasons mm -hmm. not to let people in a club. Yeah. Again, regardless of your race, 
if you're all over the place, falling over on the floor, does that club really want you in there mm. or that bar? Absolutely not. But you've come, you know, you're well mannered, well dressed, mm. you know, completely coherent and still getting an issue. And anyway, we make our way down to the to the door, the entrance bit. No, sorry, um, just had a call from the manager who's seen the CCTV and um, we can't let you in tonight, lads. We're like, on what grounds? And they're like, well, you know, we've had a bit of trouble in here recently. And so we've like looked around and we're like, okay, fine. You've had a bit of trouble. What's that got to do with us? Yeah. And again, it shouldn't matter. No. But just to make out, you've got myself who obviously used to play, now working in the media. One of my best friends is a head teacher at mm. a school. I've got another one of my best mates who no longer with us, but it was a detective in the Metropolitan Police. You know, we're all from different backgrounds. One's a fireman, one's now coaching at, at Reading. So a mixed group of professional males, mm. okay, that if they were doing those jobs mm -hmm. and were white, there wouldn't even be a question. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't even be asked or it would never come up in conversation anyway. But as you said, the only thing they're looking at is this is a group of black men that we do not want in this bar. Mm -hmm. Looking at this campaign about making sure that these types of, I mean, oh, I suppose I'm not, it's hard to even call it a microaggression because of how overt it is. It's, yeah. it's, it's racism in it, in yeah. pure and simply, isn't it? So that sense of, of the work that the EFL is doing, that, yeah. not necessarily the call to arms, but it, it's something that that's never, it feels like it's never going to go away. Um, they're just solving them, is they? We talk, we hear about education, we hear yeah. about lived and experience, we hear about sharing stories. There is, there's so much that you and I have got in common. There's so much that you and I get on with. Um, and growing up in dressing rooms and uh, different schools that you go to, my, my school was predominantly uh, white there were obviously ethnic minorities it was a it was a private school in hull which if you had say indian students it, it was the, the the broad generalization is it's sons and daughters of doctors yeah. and, and and the same thing with yeah. with uh, black and mixed race pupils as well um that had done very well for themselves pushed them in a certain direction yeah, yeah. and they're in kind of that virtuous circle comes yeah. around and then you move into football and so playing up north and then playing for Nottingham Forest and then then you start spreading your wings a little bit as a yeah, yeah. as an older adolescent coming into your teen years coming into what you do and you come and play teams Chelsea and, and uh, Tottenham and, and that's when I if I try to remember as as kind of succinctly as I can you it, you were more broadly aware aware of the reach of what football was. I mean, yeah. you watch it on TV. We've yeah, all watched yeah. footballs of a certain generation. That were yeah, fantastic. Yeah. But the the kind of formative experience of watching the Brazil team from the seventies. I mean, they, they were all yeah, predominantly yeah. black players, weren't they? Yeah. That were unbelievable yeah. athletes. And you watching it as a football fan, going, "Well, yeah. they're fantastic. I want yeah, to yeah. do what they do." Um, so then, as that kind of spread down, and it comes into that training room environment, training ground environment, it, it's not. A case of saying, well, we were always all right. We weren't racist. Yeah. But to me, it always struck me as a very inclusive environment. But I, you were always aware of potential different pitfalls for, say, a black. You're like, it's it's a brutal environment that you have to be good in. Yeah. And you'd get judged inherently on your ability and your performance. Yeah. Add the other layering of, well, am I getting judged as well because I'm black on yeah. this race? Yeah. That again is something that my particular life experience wouldn't have been wouldn't have no. even kind of thought of or absolutely not been ex ever exposed to yeah and I think that's where you know football as a whole game has got a, a huge part to play and again this is not me saying this is just a problem in football mm. and or that football can solve racism mm. or racist incidents but the reach that you say you know again the coverage that football gets in this country we absolutely have got a duty and a responsibility to have conversations mm. to raise awareness education around issues to demonstrate these things are still happening on a daily basis racism is still very much part of society depressingly mm. as much as we don't want it to be it is and there's nobody out there that can tell me any different 
so it affects football it affects different workplaces um and again for me in terms of the role that we can play it's about having that visibility that football absolutely does give so again i'll go back to my growing up in terms of in tottenham it's interesting you say about you know your childhood as well in in whole but i'm a huge believer in having to see it to be it mm. it's such a simple um slogan i suppose but it's so true so again for me growing up where i did in in north london you know forget footballers i didn't see people in my community that were necessarily like doctors you know solicitors mm. you know high-end professionals people that own their own business are very much a working class background mm. so why would a kid growing up in tottenham think i can go and achieve that or you know and i'm not saying everyone has to be that mm -hmm. but in terms of that what i would really love to do and that ambition dreaming if you actually can see somebody that looks like you mm -hmm. doing that then absolutely you then go so john barnes is a huge huge idol of mine growing up because he's born in jamaica a lot of the things that he would talk about the foods that he would eat <laughs> you know growing up i would eat what he ate yeah because he was playing for liverpool he was playing for england he was a top top player and for me that was the right if he can do it why can i not try at least mm -hmm. might not get there but i can see a black man doing it same as at wimbledon so fortunate to have and this wasn't just a black player wimbledon was an amazing place to learn my trade to grow because and it felt like the club was different to a lot of others at the time it felt to me like just growing up in tottenham we had people from so many different backgrounds we had scandinavian mm. collective we had a you know irish we had black players really prominent black players like sir robbie l carl lieburn jason Newell. Mm -hmm. you know senior players that were achieving amazing things but it, there wasn't a hierarchy of well maybe the senior players were predominantly the white ones and the black players were just seen as it was so mixed yeah. and everybody integrated superbly well together and you know we were so fortunate that we were able to be around that so again, for us as a, a group of young black boys at Wimbledon, why couldn't we be the captain yeah. or the top striker? You know, because we saw other players that were doing that. So in terms of having that ability to have an impact on on what kids can look to achieve, football's got a huge role to play. Um, just because we are so visible, mm. because we are you know such a big part of of culture in this country. Um, and it's important that we use platforms to speak about it and share our experiences. The, the campaign, of course, about making sure that supporters can call people out. Yeah. That that in itself is 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 tough, and I mean tough in the sense of people putting themselves in positions of discomfort yeah, potentially. Yeah. yeah. Something that, as we've spoken about, it seems to have been a daily occurrence for your dad. Yeah the extended family for yourself do you think it's much to ask people to do that do you think it's a a, a, a duty is it it's a responsibility a social and cultural responsibility to say well you've got to be brave enough and this is the message hopefully that people take from this you have to be brave enough to be able to say something listen i would sit here and say absolutely that is what i would want to happen and again for me listen coming from a mixed race family where you know i've never had a situation where i'm thinking anything other than this is just me mm. you know i'm half white i'm half black you know i get the best of both worlds different cultures and it is hard for me at times to get into the mind of someone who would look at somebody and want to abuse them based on the mm. color of their skin and I, i'm not going to say and sit here i understand why they do that but it's it's quite hard to put myself in their position mm -hmm what would i do if i heard that i would definitely challenge that person but i understand that for a lot of people that's not always easy the big thing for me is about coming together i do definitely and i feel very passionately that there are a vast majority of people that i've come across in my life that i work with on a day-to-day -day basis and did throughout my career who are not racist mm -hmm. and do not discriminate and i feel that if we do come together then we can certainly help to improve things. Um, is it ever going to solve racism? 
certainly not in my lifetime. Mm. Um, and I think it's that collective responsibility that I would certainly be asking others. Mm -hmm. Again, is if one person if if one person hears something, mm. the chances are ten per ten people have heard it. Yeah. And if 10 people have heard it, the chances are maybe a few more have heard it. So rather than it being that one person, maybe at a game, somebody's acting incredibly aggressively, but there are channels to do that. Whether you go off discreetly, report it to a steward, whether you do sort of say to someone next year, oh, did you hear what they just said? And mm. they agree. And then now all of a sudden two's a lot stronger than one. And you can go and say something to maybe a steward, or if it's 20, 30 people and you go and potentially maybe mention to that person that, We'd really appreciate you didn't yeah. spout that yeah. kind of stuff at, at the football match and you know obviously still would have to be reported if it's discriminatory or racist language mm -hmm. you talk about the England situation and for me you know I've got a lot of respect for Gareth just the way that he's handled these situations he has called them out he has you know really made a point of saying this isn't just something that affects Marcus Rashford mm -hmm. or Bakaya Sacco this affects the whole group. Again, Harry Kane's come out, he's spoken about it. And for me, that is really, really important that we show a united front, that we show that we are together and mean it, that mm. we are together. You look at the lack of representation in coaching mm. at the moment, management positions, administration, senior leadership positions across the whole game. And there's a massive problem there. You look at the proportion of players playing in the Premier League, black players, you look at the proportion playing in the EFL and the contribution, not just that are playing now, of black players that have made to football in this country over a large, large number of years now. Mm. And that isn't being reflected in those senior positions. So we're way past the point now of, have we got a problem with racism in the game from the playing side of it? Mm. Because I do think there's a greater understanding of cultural difference, people's individual backgrounds, where they come from, which they certainly wasn't when I was a kid. And there were certainly clubs that didn't want to engage with kids from certain areas because of a, maybe a fear of or where they're coming from, mm. not sure how to deal with them. And that is changing. If you look through most academies now, you know, not just in London, but up and down the country, people are going into inner city areas. They are recruiting because the talent is definitely mm. there, but there needs to be a better understanding. And there has been generally of how to deal with people from certain backgrounds. And that has helped with the improvement of representation on the pitch. Mm. What hasn't happened at any point is the next step. So again, what you may find at the moment is former players getting jobs in youth team jobs or younger age group jobs, but not the big job, mm -hmm. not a management job. And I think when you look at the numbers, there's nothing to tell you other than there's a huge op uh, problem mm. and it is that football and again a problem in wider society do not see black players as leaders as people that can necessarily run an organization that has to be the only answer mm. to why we have the situation that we do and we will hear the excuses that oh, well, how many have got the qualifications of, but yet their counterpart mm. with an absolutely equal playing career, maybe limited coaching experience, will still get an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that now is really what the question has to be, that has to be asked. Um, and I think football needs to be really honest with itself, understand there is a huge issue there. And initiatives are great. It's brilliant to talk and raising awareness education is so, so important. I'm a big believer in that. But now is definitely the time to take action. It's about coming together, all areas of the game, mm. and really putting some things down and have some real hard discussions about how we move things on. Because at the moment, there just seems a real blockage at a certain point and a ceiling, you know. And I think that's something that is definitely concerning. We've heard from generations past, the lost generations mm -hmm. of fantastically talented people, passionate people, highly qualified people that weren't given opportunities because they were black. And we're in danger of losing another incredibly gifted 
young generation of former players, coaches um, that want to be involved in the game at the highest level and want to manage and want to lead and are not being given those opportunities. I've got to say, it's been not just because you're a colleague and a mate, it's, it's been really interesting, informative, educational, fun in certain parts, revealing in certain parts to be able to sit and chat. Nice to be invited round, of course, as well. It's always nice to see, uh, taken to so see long. the background and the, the, the family man behind the the uh, the wonderful pundit that I, I spend a lot of time with. To say it's a big conversation is an understatement. It's vast. It's, yeah. it's mountainous, isn't it? With different kind of end finish lines in sight, which seem to be getting pushed further and further back in, in, in a lot of ways, Jobs. Given what we've spoken about, given how we've spoken about it and initiatives that we're talking about and the work that the EFL does, are there points you can pull together? Is, is there any way you can knit it together in what you want out of a conversation such as this and what broadly should be coming out of a, an initiative such as this? Yeah, listen, first of all, it is a, a big conversation, but it's a very important one and one that we absolutely must be having. I think if I'm looking at it from our point of view as the EFL or football in this country, I think the biggest thing to, to try and take out of it is, you know, we want stadiums, we want match day events to be a place for absolutely everybody. And we want everybody to be able to go and feel welcome and feel comfortable watching a game. Mm. You know, there's a reason it's the best game in the world. There's a reason we you know, got to do what we do for so long and still continue to do it. Um, cause it's just a brilliant experience to be in a stadium on a match day, you know, watching your team, um, you know, playing football. So I think for me, it would be if there were incidents, um, and again, sadly there will be like there has been in my personal life, like there are in other people's up and down the country when something does happen that obviously there is an accountability there of a wider group, mm -hmm. first and foremost, if at all possible, it's that those incidents are reported um, as swiftly as possible um, in the safest way. Again, I'm not sitting here expecting, you know, one man or one lady to necessarily go and confront someone mm -hmm. who's displaying, you know, really poor behavior, but there are processes in place to do that. And then once that has happened and it has been reported that again, I use the term zero tolerance, should be absolutely applied to every case because we do not want these people in stadiums. And I think if more of that can happen, then stadiums will become safer. They will become, I think, places where people will start to understand. And I think that's a really important thing that that will not be tolerated anymore. That language, that type of behavior. I take my kids to games as much as I can. It can be a tough place to take a 10 and an eight year old you know, with the language, mm. with the behavior, the tribalism at times. And we should be able to go and support teams and enjoy the day. And I think ultimately, as someone who's suffered racial abuse, there's always gonna be an element. That's, that's the sad facts at this moment in time in our lifetime. But when something does happen, you want it to be dealt with as seriously and as swiftly as it should be. And the bigger conversation, the, the, the bigger issues, uh, which sometimes can feel really daunting when mm -hmm. you're looking at how do we solve racism? Mm -hmm. how it's, you know, and a lot of people say impossible, but it's about dealing with these incidents as and when they occur, stamping it out as much as we can, um, and hopefully having that day to day impact that leads to longer um, change that we all want to see.